Tonight, from Liberal cabinet ministers to independent candidates. I know that my time in federal politics isn't over. The big green offer Jody Wilson-Raybould turned down. Independence will work with everyone. But do they risk splitting the vote? I'll put that question to Jane Philpott. It's a circus right now, and something has to be done. Another climber dies on Everest, the 11th this season alone. Is it time to restrict who can go up on the world's highest peak? This is actually the raw product, and this is a cooked one, so you can see where consumers get confused. The problem with frozen breaded chicken, why hundreds of Canadians have gotten sick. This is The National. They are going to go their own way, away from party politics. After months of speculation and being courted by other parties, Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott announced today they will run as independents in the next federal election. As David Cochran reports, both women promise if elected, they'll do politics differently. They've been in this together from the beginning of the SNC-Lavalin controversy. First out of cabinet, then out of caucus side by side until at least this fall. And in this election, I will be running as, as an, an independent, independent candidate. They aren't just done with the Liberal Party, they are done with all parties, resisting weeks of courtship to stay independent. The overwhelming message I received was clear. Clear how we need to do politics differently. There is no longer a political party telling me what to say. There's no longer a political staffer telling me how to vote. There are no longer corporate lobbyists that are influencing the direction that I would go. The only people that are the boss of me right now are you. Elizabeth May didn't want to be their boss, but she did want them to join a Green caucus that doubled after Paul Manley's by-election win. She even opened the door to giving up her job. I said to Jody in our first conversation, you know, are you interested in being leader of the Green Party? I think that'd be a great idea. She said no. You were serious. So yes. You were to, yes. You given up the leadership. Yes. And yes. Okay Why not? Why? I want the best possible government for Canada. I want the most Greens elected as possible. I see my friend and colleague Elizabeth May and the Green Party of Canada as natural and necessary allies. They praised the Greens but didn't join them, even though discussions continued until Friday. And unless I could feel like I was 100% authentically green, I thought the most honest thing to do was to say, you know what, I, I'm not sure exactly where I belong. Believe me, I considered it um, very seriously. Um, for me, uh, personally, I know who I am and I'm not a party person. Not a party person, but now a person without a party, without the resources a party brings with an election less than five months away. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Wilson Raybould and Phil Pott will be running against their former party. The federal Liberals say they'll soon be nominating new candidates in those ridings. And history certainly suggests the odds are stacked against independents. 74 MPs have tried to be re-elected as independents after leaving their parties, only 24 of them. So about one-third were actually successful. So why run as an independent in spite of those odds? Will promises to do politics differently actually resonate with voters? My interview with Jane Philpott a little later on The National. From going it alone to a very public compromise, today Ontario Premier Doug Ford reversed himself on millions of dollars in cuts to municipalities. Yeah, I can tell you we're, we're a government that, that listens. A growing backlash seemed to force the government's hand, restoring money to childcare, public health and ground ambulance services. Toronto alone said it stood to lose about $150 million, including more than 6,000 subsidized daycare spaces. The cuts were sprung on municipalities midway through their fiscal year. We came to the conclusion there's savings, but they need more time. Today's delay will give cities and towns time to budget and lobby. Ali Chiasson shows us how the tide turned against the government and who benefits from this reprieve. As the new mom of a three-month-old girl, 
Alana Powell is desperate for childcare. She can't afford to go back to work without a subsidized spot. Honestly, it's a nightmare because you need to get on the wait lists at all the different centers. You're just crossing your fingers that a space opens up. Then if you need subsidy, that's a whole separate other wait list you need to get yourself on too. She says Premier Doug Ford's announcement today doesn't make her feel any more secure. I'm really happy to hear that the cuts aren't happening, but that doesn't mean they're not going to happen next year. And anyone with children knows you have to plan ahead. The surprise cuts were revealed in the province's spring budget. It was left to all 444 municipalities to absorb them in the middle of their budget year. Some of them pushed back hard. People are just not going to sit by and watch them mistreat municipalities in this way, but frankly mistreat the people. Toronto Mayor John Tory door knocked. Community groups mobilized too, getting more than 31,000 people in Toronto to sign a petition demanding the province reverse the cuts. The mayors of Ontario's largest cities wrote to the Premier. And today, Ford backed down. Are we right 1,000% of the time? I wish we were right 1,000% of the time. Are municipalities right 1,000? No, they aren't, they aren't right 1,000% of the time. But when we work together, uh, we can do some, some really great, great things. But this is just a delay. More cuts are coming. The work to communities now is to explain really, um, you know, how funding works in childcare, that there isn't, um, you know, a whole bunch of uh, gravy or, or wiggle room. Advocates for public health say it's not a luxury either. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Mike Crawley is our Ontario Provincial Affairs reporter. Uh, Mike, Doug Ford, was, he was sure standing tough on this issue last week, so why the compromise today? Well, Rosemary, you saw the pushback there was in Ali's story. And on top of all that, there was a series of opinion polls that showed a steep drop in support for Doug Ford's progressive conservatives. Ford wouldn't tell me if those polls had an impact on his decision, but it's hard to imagine that plummeting approval wasn't a factor. And, and I know that uh, his federal cousins, Andrew Scheer, in that party is, is watching all of this unfold pretty closely as well. Yeah, uh, federal liberals and conservatives are telling me that Ford's budget cuts have become a bit, a bit of a drag on Andrew Scheer's polling numbers in Ontario. And that matters, of course, because of all the swing ridings that the federal conservatives are targeting in this province. The strategists that I've spoken to say it's not likely to be a deciding factor come the October federal election, but there's clearly some concern among conservatives that they've been taking some collateral damage over Ford's cuts. Okay, so municipalities get a bit of a reprieve, but Ford was, after all, elected to do this, to balance the budget, to make some cuts. So what's the next battle here? Well, the next budget fight is a schoolyard brawl. All the contracts for the teachers' unions expire in August. The government seems to be signaling that it wants teachers to agree to wage freezes, and that won't go down well at the bargaining table. So watch out for labor disruption in Ontario schools this fall. Okay, lots happening in politics in this province. Thanks, Mike Crawley. Appreciate it. We call companies like Google, Amazon, and Facebook tech giants for a reason. Facebook alone has a vast database on user behavior, enormous influence over what they see, and a bigger operating budget than the entire Canadian government. Which is why representatives from a dozen countries are in Ottawa tonight to appear at a committee hoping to regulate big tech. And as Olivia Stefanovic tells us, Facebook has responded. The Wild West online era cannot continue. A sense of urgency. The Minister of Democratic Institutions is calling on social media giants to combat disinformation ahead of an election and be more transparent about who is funding the posts in our feeds. Inaction is not an option. Disinformation must not stand. The world's largest social media company says it will take down accounts that try to interfere with the upcoming federal election. But there's no penalty if it breaks the promise. We as a public can now hold them accountable and if that's not the case, then following the election, they can probably count on the fact that there's going to be regulation. There are already fears that promise from Facebook is just as empty as this chair, meant for founder Mark Zuckerberg. He and his chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, were subpoenaed to appear before Parliament. Instead, they're sending the head of public policy of Facebook Canada. 
for lawmakers, that's not good enough. Mr. Zuckerberg has stated publicly that he wants to work with legislators. Um, well, this is his opportunity. MPs are threatening Zuckerberg and Sandberg with contempt. To be held in contempt of parliament of, a, of an entire country, essentially, wouldn't be a great thing for a platform. With a multinational company that serves billions of people, it's unclear such a ruling could hold much weight outside of Canada's borders. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. For years, tech giants have spent millions in Canada and the U.S. lobbying lawmakers to let them just self-regulate. But as signs of abuse have multiplied, government pressure is now growing. A month ago, Ottawa found that Facebook broke the law by mishandling private data in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but... All I can uh, actually do is recommend to Facebook uh, that they change uh, their ways, and they have disagreed to do that. In the U.S., though, Facebook could face fines of up to $5 billion over the scandal. The EU has already subjected tech companies to sweeping privacy restrictions. Google has engaged in illegal practices. And it has slapped Google with three fines, totaling $10 billion for abusing its dominance of the market. But some are saying fines just aren't enough when tech gets too big. We can't vote with our feet. We can't vote with our eyeballs. And so well, you we need government to step wait. in. Facebook's co-founder called for the social media giant to be broken up by regulators. Because I think most Americans know that the best way to hold a company accountable is competition. Tech companies are also facing pressure to police content. France is working on fines for tech companies that systematically fail to remove extremist content. And Germany has fines that are already on the books. Since this image caught the world's attention a few days ago, more people have died in the quest to conquer Mount Everest, at least 11 now, during this climbing season. Many of them suffered from exhaustion and altitude sickness. But as Alison Northcott tells us, some say the real problem last week was overcrowding. It's a grueling trek to the world's highest summit. Third? Yeah. Very tired. For some, it's about the joy of reaching it. It's exhilarating to stand on top of the world. It was also, you know, a little bit disturbing because there were just so many people up there. Ottawa's Elia Sakely is an experienced climber who recently summited Everest for the third time. He says it will be his last. You've got 80 or 90 people in front of you. You're in pitch darkness. An hour and a half later, there's a body, you know, that is attached to the anchor point where two lines meet. And every single person that was climbing to the summit had to climb over that deceased climber. And you realize that, you know, what happened to them could potentially happen to you. And you're in a state of survival. This picture emerged last week, showing a packed line of climbers in the so-called death zone, where oxygen levels are low and people are forced to wait. Sakely and others say these traffic jams are partly to blame for a number of deaths, along with a short weather window to safely summit. And they say Nepalese authorities issued too many permits this year. I think maybe like there should be a limit on how many people go up each day, because you only have a limited supply of oxygen. It's a circus right now, and something has to be done. There were no crowds when Gabriel Filippi reached the summit earlier this month for the third time, but he says he's seen a lot of inexperienced climbers in over their heads. There's greed also. People want to make money, so they don't. Some expedition don't refuse clients. They don't do a screen up. So some people don't have any experience, they end up on the mountain. Nepalese officials told the Washington Post it's not as much about the number of permits as it is about the kinds of climbers getting them. They say they'll decide how to move forward after this year's expeditions are done. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Last week's tragic events pushed the total number of known deaths on Mount Everest past 300. From 1922 until this past weekend, it's estimated that 307 people have died on Everest. More than a third of them were Nepalese, many of them Sherpa mountain guides who prepare the climbing routes and carry supplies. Allison mentioned the death zone in her report. That's the area above 8,000 meters where most of those climbers lost their lives. We're watching other developing stories this hour on The National, including a mass stabbing in Japan, leaving more than a dozen people injured. Japan's national broadcaster reporting that three are in critical condition. It happened in Kawasaki, south of Tokyo. 
It's believed a man started attacking people waiting at a bus stop. At least 19 are injured, and that includes 13 primary school children. The man was arrested at the scene. He was treated for a stab wound to the shoulder, but police say he has died. A man is in custody tonight after a hit and run that left a four-year-old boy in critical condition with a serious brain injury. It happened yesterday in Markham, northeast of Toronto. Security cameras captured the suspects riding a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Tonight, a 31-year-old man is charged with failure to remain at the scene. Police say he did not have a license. In northern Alberta, crews face dry, windy conditions today as they continue to battle the out-of-control Chuck Egg Creek fire, now covering more than 300 hectares. A new wildfire also started last night, just southeast of Trout Lake. Nearly 5,000 residents have been out of their homes for a week. The heavy smoke is causing concerns about the air quality. Well, it's turned now to a story of celebration for Canadian basketball fans as the Toronto Raptors' incredible run continues, thanks in large part to this man, Kawhi Leonard. More than 3 million Canadians watched the Raps advance to the NBA championships for the very first time on television, but only a lucky few witnessed it live inside Toronto's Scotiabank Arena. Our Devin Haru looks at the quest to be there for Game 1. Legions of Raptors fans still basking today in the glow of their superstar Kawhi Leonard and Saturday's historic win. It's too good to be true, but we deserve it. We have the best fans. For those lucky enough to be inside the arena on Saturday, an incredible experience. And now this, the first ever NBA championship game to be played on Canadian soil, Raps versus Warriors Thursday night in Toronto. And fans are scrambling for tickets. I feel like Drake might buy all tickets in the front. Those are his prices. Translation, unaffordable for most. Tickets went up for sale on Ticketmaster earlier tonight and they were gone within minutes. Now they're popping up on resale sites with requested prices on the low end at about 900 Canadian dollars, climbing all the way to 67,000 Canadian for courtside seats. We even started thinking about going to um, California because tickets could be cheaper there. I will go to the game on Thursday hoping that somebody will send me a ticket, but I know the scalper will sell it to me for three times the price. I have a big shoe collection, so uh, I would sell. We were, yeah, we yeah, were thinking about yeah. selling, yeah. selling some of my shoes. Peel Regional Police just west of Toronto say they've already received reports of ticket scams targeting Raps fans and expect it to continue warning fans do not prepay for anything on sites such as Kijiji, LetGo and eBay. Do not assume that the tickets are legitimate if paying cash and if the purchase price appears too good to be true, it likely is. I knew they would be a lot, but at the numbers I'm hearing, they're astronomical. This marketing expert says he's never seen anything like this. There's also the, the FOMO factor, the fear of missing out. If, if you don't take advantage of it now, will the team come back in the, in the finals in our lifetime? The question driving the craze, a fan base whipped into a frenzy, and a chance to say, I was there. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Well, I won't be there with those prices, <laughs> Ian, but I'll watch on TV. <laughs> Still ahead on tonight's National, I sit down with Jane Philpott to ask why she's running as an independent. And when going green becomes a power trip in a manner of speaking, David Common is at the wheel as we test the range of electric cars. But next, check your freezer. Something might be in there that you need to know about. And some of these processing lines operate at 70 birds a minute. That's quite a lot of birds going through. A salmonella outbreak has led to a recall of breaded chicken strips. We'll tell you more after this. If you have chicken strips sitting in your freezer, time to check the packaging. Health authorities are recalling some compliments brand because of salmonella. 11 people in seven provinces have already gotten sick. This latest recall covers strips with a best before date of November 24th. This isn't the first time health officials have had to pull breaded frozen chicken from store shelves. Vicodopia shows us why.
It's a crowd pleaser that requires minimal effort, just heat and eat. Many of us aren't even getting that right, undercooking, microwaving and mishandling raw processed chicken products, leading to more cases of salmonella. The problem is raw breaded chicken can be almost indistinguishable from the cooked version. Well, intuitively, you can see this is much lighter brown, this is darker brown, so you would have said, oh, this must be the uncooked one. But the reality is, just looking at the pack, uh, this is actually the raw product and this is a cooked one, so you can see where consumers get confused. At this food safety lab, salmonella is the most common pathogen identified. The bacteria is in about 20% of commercial poultry. Sometimes it starts in the chicken feed and it doesn't take much for it to spread. Some of these processing lines operate at 70 birds a minute. That's quite a lot of birds going through. And literally they go into baths and they get plucks and that, and that just spreads contamination everywhere. This latest outbreak is of Salmonella enteritidis, a hypervirulent species of bacteria. In the past two years, labs have confirmed 584 cases. 97 people were hospitalized, of which three died from complications. But health officials estimate for every reported case of Salmonella, there are 26 unreported, so as many as 15,000 Canadians could have been infected. The Public Health Agency of Canada says the high number of cases could be the result of new DNA testing of bacteria that's faster at identifying an outbreak. But new food safety standards came into effect last month. Now every piece of frozen raw chicken will have to be tested for salmonella, though there are still untested products left on the market. I think it's just going to take a little bit more time while the raw products work their way through the marketplace in people's homes. The new testing will lead to higher costs, so it's expected more frozen chicken strips and nuggets on the market will soon end up being pre-cooked. Some might taste the difference, though not everyone will notice. <laughs> Vicodopia, CBC News, Guelph, Ontario. Still ahead, Uber takes the dive, and environmentalists say that's actually good news for the Great Barrier Reef. But next, the future according to Jane Philpott and the challenges she faces if she's elected as an independent MP. I don't want to pretend that I think that it's going to be easy uh, as an independent MP to be able to influence uh, pieces of legislation. But certainly, as I said to the people of Markham Stouffville today, they will be the ones who will be able to, to tell me how they feel. And I look forward to being able to represent them that way. only people that are the boss of me right now are you. You, the people of Markham Stovall, you're the boss of me. Jane Philpott was a star of the Liberal cabinet since she got elected in 2015, serving as Ministers of Health, Indigenous Affairs and Treasury Board President. In March, she resigned from cabinet as part of the very public disagreement over the SNC-Lavalin file before being thrown out of the Liberal caucus entirely. And as you heard earlier today, the MP for Markham Stouffville ended weeks of speculation announcing that she will seek re-election in October as an independent. And Jane Philpott joins me here in studio tonight. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Thanks for making the time. In what way did belonging to a political party limit you in some way, either as an MP or a minister? Well, there is no question that parties have their purpose. Obviously, it's great to be able to organize with others, to be able to have the structure of a party, to uh, draw in a lot of people on building policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I certainly don't think that parties in and of themselves are problematic. I do think the party uh, discipline and power has, in some cases, gone beyond what is in the best interest of Canadians when it is, for instance, the party or unelected political staff that are dictating everything that ministers say and even that MPs say, dictating how people vote. And that's the part that I think Canadians are concerned about. Can, can you give me an example of that, though? Because you're a, you're a strong, uh, smart person. It, it might be difficult for people to believe that uh, a staffer told you what to say and what to do and that you just did it. Well, you're absolutely right. I didn't always do what I was told, but certainly every single minister is given lines to sure. to repeat or to to put forward and that's again not necessarily a bad thing but when you have for instance every single vote in the house of commons when parties are uh, literally a 
sheet of paper put on every member of parliament's desk dictating how those mm -hmm. members of parliament will vote, it gives you pause to think who's in charge and, and who should be in charge is the people of Canada, our constituents. And so uh, that some of those things are concerning and there's a certain amount of freedom to being independent. Right, but, but that that's not really true, that, that MPs have to vote however they're dictated. And I would point you to that genetic discrimination bill that the Prime Minister and, and your friend Jody Wilson-Raybould said, you have to vote this way. And in fact, more than 100 Liberal MPs stood up and voted the, the other way, the way mm -hmm, that their leader mm -hmm. didn't want them to. So I'm, I'm not sure how much truth there is to what you're saying. Are you saying that MPs just follow blindly leaders I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't you... wanted to suggest that uh, that MPs necessarily follow blindly, and I think that's a great thing when there is that freedom and flexibility, and certainly that is there in some cases. But there uh, is a strong pressure to uh, toe the party line, to uh, not necessarily go against uh, the party on a particular sure. piece of legislation. Your position, though, the reason you're getting attention today and other days since all of this started is because you bought into that party ideal. I mean, that's what's elevated you to this status. So do you recognize the importance of that, that, that you wouldn't, if you were just independent Jane Philpott right now, we probably wouldn't be doing an interview. I totally accept what you're saying. Uh, I didn't want to be in this position. I didn't expect to be in this position uh, that I'm in. So this is a, a reality that I had to face. I had hoped when I stepped down uh, from cabinet that I would be able to stay in the Liberal caucus and, and that wasn't possible. So now I had a decision to make about going forward and I believe that I still have a, a role to play in federal politics. It will be up to the people of Markham Stovall to decide for sure. But I want to present myself as an option if people believe that I can represent them best. You, you know that, that, you, that your riding it has been conservative. You, you won by, I think, close to 4,000 votes. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about splitting the vote and ending up with uh, conservatives representing your riding? And I don't think you're strongly aligned with the conservatives on many issues. No, I am running because I hope that I will win. Uh, I acknowledge that it's going to be challenging. This is not something that we have a big model for here in Canada. I hope that people will look to this and say, yes, this is a good thing. We could do with more independent You, you do realize that that sounds a bit utopian, though. It, it, the system, the electoral system is not set up for this. The Westminster parliamentary system is not set up for this. There's a reason we have parties. Well, there is a reason that we have parties, but I would argue with you that Canada is one of the countries that have a parliamentary democracy that is the least... Uh, friendly to independence to date, but I believe that there are many opportunities to have a voice. I can speak uh, on many occasions in the House, I can speak uh, to the public and certainly push and work with others. Could you be a Liberal if there was a different leader? At the moment it's not an option for me, so uh, it uh, was a decision that was taken out of my hands and I will move forward and do the best to serve the people of my community. Okay. Jane Philpott, thanks for coming in thanks tonight. Thanks for having Appreciate me. It. Nice to see you. Still ahead on tonight's program, fasten your seatbelt, David Common goes electric and hits the road for a test drive. How did things go so wrong? How did we end up driving with no heat at night outside Detroit, late for an appointment and about to run out of the fuel we need? But first, a look at a story you'll see tomorrow night on The National about the high price of treating opioid addiction. Many say options in the public system are inadequate, so some parents are going a different route. Here's Bonnie Allen with a preview. Stacy Bereza decided to take an expensive gamble. She booked her son into a privately run drug rehab facility in Nanaimo, BC. Okay, mom, okay, mom, I'll go. Okay, you're serious, you wanna do this. I wanna do this, mom, I can't live like this anymore. The price tag? $10,000 a month. She cashed in her entire retirement savings, sinking into debt. My son wasn't my son for years. And this was, this was the hope of getting my boy back. bothered at all by the small missiles. No, I'm not. I am personally not. 
The U.S. president appearing unfazed by North Korea's recent missile tests. He made the comments during a joint news conference with the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, despite Japan saying the rockets are a violation of U.N. resolutions. In a word, stay home. This is very unusual for us to tell people to do that. New Brunswick officials issued a stern warning today after three new cases of measles. Two are linked to a previous case at a high school, the third to St. John Regional Hospital's emergency department. There are now eight confirmed cases in the St. John area. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. This is The Current. And a big change coming from one of our colleagues and her many listeners. Anna Maria Tremonti is leaving The Current after 16 seasons. She's been there since the show debuted on CBC Radio 1. She's not going far, though. Anna Maria will be producing and hosting podcasts. American author there are more than 93,000 electric vehicles on the road in Canada. And starting this month, you can get a federal rebate when you're buying a new one. It's $2,500 or $5,000, depending on the vehicle type and range. But many people still aren't sure that they are dependable. So we sent David Common and his crew on a road trip. Here's another look at how they made out. How did things go so wrong? How do we end up driving with no heat at night outside Detroit, late for an appointment and about to run out of the fuel we need? It's our first adventure with a fully electric car and it began by renting Arthur Potts entry level battery only vehicle. Welcome. How are you? Very well indeed, good to see you. The, this is it. This is it, the okay. Kia Soul. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit more expensive, but now I think the cost benefit, you're nuts to buy an internal combustion engine if you're driving around a city. I save maybe 3,000, 3,500 a year in gasoline. Turns out POTS pushed EVs in the last Ontario government. I was the junior minister for environment uh, and climate change. Drivers are still shy of battery only offerings, no gas engine at all. So what's holding us back? That's four things. Cost to buy, range, how far they can go between charging, whether there are enough charging stations, and the time it takes to recharge. Along with producer Jill and videographer Ed, I'm testing those out on this journey. So 11 and a half million Canadians do what we're doing right now, and that is commute by car to work. On average, they drive 23 kilometers one way, which means 46 there and back. Starting with 138 kilometers of range, we drive 50 kilometers on the highway one way, then add some stops on city streets for a return journey of 60K. Remaining range, about 28 kilometers. Total cost to recharge at home, under two bucks. How many times do we stop at a gas station? Not once. Not once. But we knew this part was gonna be easy. All the EV experts we consulted said these cars are a no-brainer for city driving. But what if you need to take a road trip? Yeah, so tomorrow we head to Detroit. Yikes. Overnight, we're using a level one charger, the smallest and slowest there is. Okay, so we parked the car at six o'clock last night, started charging it at 7.30 now, 11 and a half hours later. How are we doing? The car is at 86%, and it could actually take five more hours of charging to get up to 100%. That's okay. This is enough for what we need to do today. And what are we doing? Well, it's actually a little bit risky. We are going 400 kilometers all the way to Detroit. It's a big road trip in an electric vehicle, one we've never done. Teslas, like the one next to us here, can make the trip in just one stop. But for us, in this much cheaper $35,000 car, we're looking at a max range of 165 kilometers. Cold weather can shrink that down by a quarter, so trip planning is key. If we go dead, it's not like you can just walk to a gas station because not everywhere can give you a charge. Exactly. Basically, our experiment is yeah, over. Is over. Yeah. Jill is using an app to track where we can recharge along the way, and we can use that app to pay for the top-ups as well. Okay, never done this before, so let's see. Plug the charging connector into your vehicle. I think it's this one. Or is it? No? Yeah. That looks right. Yeah. 
so here we go. The app actually says how long it's been, how long it's costing me. It's $20 an hour to do this, but this is a fast charger, so it's gonna go pretty quickly. 20% charged right now. The stop gives us time to make a call. A chat with an EV expert, Simon Willette of Charge Hub. Hi, Simon. Hey, how's it going? Well, it's okay. We're, we're on our first stop. So we got about 100 kilometers and uh, you can see it. Here we are with our car and our charging station and it's at 65% right now after only about 10 minutes. What do we need to know about sort of maximizing our mileage, our range? Cabin heat um, takes up a lot more energy. So dress warm, that'll get you a lot of extra miles. We're at 80% right now. So I think I'm gonna wrap this call up with you because we're gonna disconnect and hit the road. Back on the road and the heat's turned way down to extend our range. Uh-oh. And after another 100 kilometers? Please visit the nearby charging station. Uh, time for another stop. Pretty soon we'll be redlining it. Oh, there you go. Okay, uh, just pulled on off the highway here. Not quite running on fumes, but we got 16 kilometers of range left. So we really pushed the limit on this In one. 300 meters, turn right on Wellington Road. There we go. So I think for this stop, we're gonna wanna go above 80%. The next stop is 116 kilometers away and there's nothing between here and there. Okay, get the app out. $20 an hour to use this. We'll probably use it for about half an hour. After lunch and back on the road for half an hour, and that's when things start to go wrong. We should have taken a different Oh, is that why you're saying that? Okay. Yeah. Are we way off? How far off of our plan are we? relative to where our next charging station is. This says there's two yeah. stations available. Like what are we close to here? We could go backwards. I don't think we should go backwards. Uh, but we have to find something in front of us. So, a new route it is. Okay. Time for recharge, and not a moment too soon. We are only about 10 kilometers of range left. All right, it's charging, 9% already. Might as well get something warm inside. Okay, let me think. None of this was part of the plan. We're now late, so supposed to be in Detroit in less than an hour with no chance of making it. And now, another issue. The charger we're plugged into is not charging at the rate we've become accustomed to. It's um, going slower. Time to phone a friend. Simon's our EV lifeline. We ended up taking a different route than we planned, and so we didn't go to the charger that we planned. We found another charger. We're at that charger, but it's taking much longer than we thought it would, even though it's still a level three. Why is that? Uh, usually you'll, you'll see 50 kilowatts. So that's probably what you've been charging at most of the day today, but now you've probably hit one that, that is throttled down to a lower, a lower power. It's about 100 kilometers from here to there, and our car is not charged up sufficiently for that right now. Oh, no, that. 107. 107? Okay, so I'm going to go out and see if we got that much. Fifty-two percent. That's not going to be enough. So our range right now is 78 kilometers. It's not enough to get us to Detroit. So I think we're probably going to have to wait it out. The alternative is driving to a faster charger than this one, but it's a bit of a gamble. We have just enough range remaining to make it, but not enough time. We need to speed up and doing so reduces the range faster. To compensate, we're turning all the heat off and it gets very cold very fast. But we do make it to the auto show just before it closes. Okay, we made it. To meet Paul Rizuski of the Toronto Electric David. Vehicle Association. Good to meet you. Thanks so much well. for waiting for us. Okay, my hands are frozen, my feet are frozen. We had to turn everything off in order to get here. 
Here's so, my thing. People are going to look at what we've done, and they're going to say, uh-oh, I don't know about an EV. The, the good news is that you drove a previous generation electric car. So over there is the same car you were driving. It's being introduced with more than double the size of the battery. In other words, we could have made it without recharging or maybe recharging once. A very different kind of story and gives you a sense of where EVs are headed. It makes you realize how in just two years, a single car model has really extended its range. There are some lessons though. EVs certainly can be affordable and seem great for city commutes, but not all models are suitable for longer road trips. Still, progress is happening and happening quickly. Longer ranges, shorter recharges, and more charging stations. David Common, CBC News, Detroit. Just ahead, an Edmonton mother takes a leap of faith to escape a raging fire. I heard jump, and I just knew that if I didn't jump, because I had already been on the phone for so long, it just felt like forever. And take a look at who she was holding in her arms. Our moment is coming up, but first. In case you missed it, Australia's Great Barrier Reef is one of the world's most stunning and fragile natural wonders, and now accessible by Uber. And no, I'm not talking about taking an Uber to Australia. They're not doing that, at least not yet. But the Australian government is teaming up with the so-called ride-sharing company to raise money and awareness to protect this vast and complex ecosystem. We all know that you can see the Great Barrier Reef from space, but from today you'll be able to see the Great Barrier Reef from the world's very first ride-sharing submarine. Scuba provides breathtaking underwater tours up to 30 meters down. The glass canopy affords a fantastic view, and the submarine is stable enough to resist the powerful currents in the area, which is important. The reef suffers serious damage from accidental contact with divers and those who secretly break off pieces for souvenirs. Now, scuba tours don't come cheap. They cost about $2,700 for a pair of seats, but they do come with a helicopter ride to the departure point, and Uber is donating $100,000 to reef conservation. Some environmentalists think private-public partnerships can do good. All business, all government, we are at a stage now where we need every hand to the pump. Scuba runs until June 18. An Alberta mom is recovering after she escaped from her burning home, Babe in Arms. When Amber Dyke woke up to the smell of smoke and then saw the flames, she grabbed her son, Damon, and headed to a window. A neighbor was below and told her to jump. Amber's story is our moment. Every breath that I took, it just felt like I was breathing in fire. So I went and I grabbed Damon immediately. I pushed the, the screen through the window and I kind of held Damon outside the window so he could at least get some fresh air because he started struggling. And uh, I just started screaming, I got to jump. So I did. And I just put him here and my, my intent was to land on my back so that I could cushion his fall. And they said, as far as we can tell, he doesn't even have a scratch. He's totally just out of it. I would do it again in a heartbeat, absolutely. That little monkey doesn't even know what happened. Anyway, his mom, as she did that, jumped out the window backwards, uh, landed on her back, obviously. She now has eight screws and two rods down her spine. Part of her spine has been fused together, so she has some limited mobility, but she, she will be fine over time.
I mean, just think, Rosie, about that moment, right? Like every parent looks at their kid, especially when it, the kid is little and you think you'd do anything for him or her, but to actually contemplate jumping out a window of a burning home and, as you say, landing on your back. Mm. There, there's little good news other than the fact that neither of them had any kind of burn or smoke injuries. The child is obviously fine. And the neighbor, a paramedic, happened to be up early to go to shift and was there to, to help her and pull her away from the burning Crazy. home. Crazy. Crazy. What a story. That is the National for this Monday, May 27th. Good night.